Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science, your weekly source for the latest science news. In the headlines this week, a fossil trackway has been discovered that shows a prehistoric fish dragging itself onto land 10 million years before terrestrial vertebrates were probably walking. New evidence of early human species coexisting with each other has been uncovered. A brain implant that translates inner thoughts into speech has been kept secure with password protection. And much more. Our top story this week is the discovery of a fossilised trackway preserving ancient marks scoured into the sediment, made when a prehistoric lungfish dragged itself onto land. This in itself is quite remarkable, but what's truly fascinating about this trackway is its age. It was found in the Holy Cross Mountains of Poland and dates to the early Devonian period, between 410 and 393 million years ago. However, the oldest known evidence for land locomotion by tetrapods, the group including us and our ancestors, dates to more recent times towards the start of the Middle Devonian. Therefore, this lungfish was exploring land some 10 million years before the first fully terrestrial tetrapods were walking. The traces show elongated depressions caused by the body being dragged, longitudinal furrows from fin movements, and depressions that appear to be traces of the fish's snout, as it pushed into the sediment to anchor itself and create leverage to lift the body. The paleontologists who describe these fossil traces support these conclusions using observations of modern lungfish, which create strikingly similar and very distinctive traces when moving on land, rotating their bodies and supporting themselves with their heads. The scientists also identified another kind of trace in the fossil trackway, showing two pairs of furrows that appear to be resting traces, made when the fish stopped for a bit, causing the pectoral and pelvic fins to dig into the sediment. All these marks were made in very shallow water and across stretches of exposed sediment, with the lungfish's body at least partially emerging from the water. The discovery of these ancient land excursions is clearly very intriguing within the context of tetrapod evolution. Today, lungfish are the closest living relatives of tetrapods, the group that includes all amphibians, reptiles, birds and mammals. The fact that a prehistoric lungfish could briefly drag itself onto land long before evidence of the first terrestrial tetrapods suggests that tetrapods were pre-adapted for walking on land. This means they evolved from ancestors with anatomical features that were initially used for other functions, such as feeding in very shallow waters, which later proved very useful when they began to exploit terrestrial niches. The fact that lungfish were performing this behaviour strongly suggests that pre-tetrapods were doing it too. Another very interesting discovery made with the analysis of the fossil traces is that the prehistoric lungfish were apparently left-handed. Most traces of body twisting across the sediment showed a preference for twisting to the left, and this dominance was statistically significant, possibly representing the earliest known instance of handedness in vertebrate animals. Asymmetrical whole body actions are common among many vertebrate groups, however like humans there is generally a preference for the right side, so it's noticeable that these early lungfish may have been left-handed. This study is so fascinating for many reasons, adding yet another remarkable chapter to the story of how we became adapted for life on land. Next up in the recent paleontology news, new discoveries of prehistoric hominin fossils at a site in Ethiopia have yielded more evidence of different human species coexisting millions of years ago. The time interval between 3 and 2 million years ago is crucial for understanding human evolution, as this is when the oldest members of our genus Homo first appeared. At this site in Ethiopia, new fossil findings suggest that a very early Homo species was present between 2.8 and 2.6 million years ago, alongside a species of Australopithecus that lived here 2.63 million years ago. Homo likely evolved from a specific species of Australopithecus, and so it's interesting to see evidence of these humans living together as they did in other locations too. These hominin discoveries at the site are only known from tooth fossils, but their anatomy is very revealing. Excitingly, when they compared the Australopithecus teeth to other known species, they did not quite match, hinting at the existence of a new Australopithecus species at the site. 
However, it's too fragmentary to be named for now. Therefore, these findings not only confirm the ancient age of the Homo genus, but also contribute to the expanding complexity of human evolution with this tantalizing evidence of yet another Australopithecus species. Well, we've got some news about black holes now, as a study published in the Astrophysical Journal Letters that presents a new hypothesis on the origin of supermassive black holes. The researchers propose that Population 3.1, or III-1, supermassive stars are responsible for the formation of the supermassive black holes that we see lying in the centre of many galaxies. These Population 3.1 are stars from the very beginning of the universe, believed by many to have grown to a truly colossal size in part due to the influence of energy from something called dark matter annihilation. This paper suggests an event where these stars ionise the hydrogen gas in the early universe incredibly rapidly, calling this era of time the Flash. The authors of this paper propose that supermassive black holes are the remnants of POP 3.1 stars from this cataclysmic time, and go on to say that this proposition could actually go a fair way into solving some of physics most pressing recent tensions, such as the recent observations that suggest that dark energy might be dynamic. Let's hope further studies can relieve these scientific tensions further. And there's actually some more black hole news for you now, this one from just over a week ago. Astronomers publishing their work in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society believe they may have found the largest black hole ever observed. Now this is a little bit tricky to completely verify, because past a certain point it's very difficult to work out the mass of black holes. Usually the method used analyses the material around the black hole and its behaviour to work out its mass, but this doesn't really work for particularly distant black holes and can be fairly inaccurate. Astronomers studying the most massive known galaxy, the Cosmic Horseshoe, imaged where they believed a black hole is using both NASA's Hubble telescope and ESO's Very Large telescope, putting this data into a computer model of the galaxy that accounted for various observational and astronomical phenomena. They concluded that the mass of the black hole they were observing, about 5 billion light years away from Earth, has 36 billion times the mass of our Sun. They believe their findings are accurate to plus or minus 35%. And while other methods have found potentially more massive black holes, they are considered to be less reliably accurate. Hopefully this new method can lead to a better understanding of one of the most fascinating objects of our universe. In other news, scientists working on brain implants that can translate brain signals into speech have found a way to prevent this technology from accidentally decoding private inner thoughts by making the system password protected. Brain computer interfaces, or BCIs, show great potential for assisting people who struggle to communicate due to injury or illness by decoding the internal speech occurring inside the human brain. Previous versions of BCIs relied on decoding attempted speech, where participants tried to speak as best as they could, but being able to use internal speech alone would clearly make a speech BCI much easier to use. This research demonstrated that they could read brain activity associated with internal speech, and using AI models they could correctly interpret 74% of sentences imagined by the participants. However, decoding internal speech raises the issue of how to keep private thoughts private, so they introduced password protection. The participants had to imagine a keyword before the decoding output was activated, in this case the password chitty chitty bang bang, as it's phonetically complex and not commonly used in conversation. Remarkably, the BCI was able to recognise the imagined password with an accuracy rate exceeding 98%. It's a very exciting study testing a technology that could help a lot of people in the future. Finally, for the news this week, a report from the Australian Institute of Marine Science reveals the devastating impact of the Great Barrier Reef's most recent mass coral bleaching event, which began in 2024 and continued through 2025. This is the second time the reef has suffered back-to-back -back bleaching events within consecutive years. The first was in 2016 and 2017. As the planet warms, bleaching events are becoming both more frequent and more severe. The Great Barrier Reef's crisis is part of a wider global bleaching event, with over 80% of the world's coral reefs now affected. 
While corals can sometimes recover if heat stress eases, scientists warn that reefs are approaching a tipping point. With disturbances striking so often, recovery windows are shrinking and coral cover may no longer be able to bounce back. To safeguard coral reefs, scientists stress the urgent need for global action to cut greenhouse gas emissions and stabilise ocean temperatures. At the same time, local measures such as reducing pollution and managing other pressures remain essential for giving reefs the best chance to survive. If you would like to learn more about coral bleaching, then take a look at Ben's mum's video. The link to it is in the description. Well, that's it for the news this week. I really hope you enjoyed learning about everything that's happened in these last seven days of science. Be sure to email us at sevendos.stories at gmail.com if you have any research you'd like to see us cover, or if you want to let us know how we can improve the show. You can follow Seven Days of Science on Instagram and TikTok, and also be sure to support us on Patreon if you enjoy what we do here. Our patrons have been enjoying early previews of all of our recent Seven Days of Science scripts before the episodes themselves are released, so don't miss out on that. As always, a big thank you to our patrons, including Andrew Kawam, Kang Yin, Chippy Chippy Chapa Chapa, Clara Middleton, Dean A. Batha, Diana Hernandez, Drub Strivastava, Gabriella, Gary Arrington, Giotist, I Rage, John French, Joseph Ree, Corey Peterson, Lena Rose, Mark Nevin, Matt Grandis, Mendicant Fryer, Mike Pace, Monitor Man, Ralph Balzac, Robert Priepazika Jr., Robert Thomas, Sammy Potricus, Staniforth Hopkins, Steve Bradshaw, Thomas. Thomas F. Conroy III, Timothy and Ted Rowe, and Troy Schmidt. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you again next week.